Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be standing in for Rachel Pope um, and best wishes to Rachel if, if she's ill. Um, and I'm going to be talking, as Jack said, about um, a small hill fort in the Cluidians, Mauli Gaia Bodfari. Um, and actually, this is the next hill fort to Penniclothii along the Cluidian range. So it's sort of relevant in a way in comparative terms to what Rachel would have been talking about. Um, if, if, you, if you don't know who I am, I'm a retired professor from the University of Oxford, and I've worked on hill forts for many, many years. I excavated several on the Ridgeway in Oxfordshire, um, and I've worked in Spain and Italy on hill forts, and then Moligaya in Wales. And as Jack said, my current project is Nescliffe Camp, which is just outside Shrewsbury. And we'll be back there in August, if any of you would like to visit. That's a tremendous excavation. Um, I was also co-principal investigator for the Atlas of Hill Forts, which some of you may be familiar with, which is an online resource that maps and gives information about all of the hill forts in Britain and Ireland, over 4,000 of them. Okay, well, let's um, get cracking with this talk. Now, the background to this and to Rachel's work at Penny Clothii is very much the Heather and Hillforts project, which many of you will know about, and some of you may even have worked on. It was run by Fiona Gale when she was um, County Archaeologist for Denbyshire. And it looked at these six hill forts down, down the Cluidians and, um, and in the Flanticilios um, at the bottom, uh, to the south of the Cluidian range. Um, and on the back of that project, because that project really was more to do with public involvement and earthwork survey and some minimal geophysics, on the back of that, part of the intention was to start more detailed projects. So we've got the hill forts of North Wales that um, Ray Carl at the University of Bangor when he was at Bangor um, carried out. And then we've got Rachel's work at Penny Clothii and our work at Bodfari, all sort of piggybacked on the back of the Heather and Hill Forts project. Um, if you're not familiar with the Bodfari Hill Fort, then it's often claimed to be in a strategic, and I use that word in quotes, a strategic location. So these are the views, the four views, north, south, east, west, uh, west across the Vale of Cluid, south as you can see down the Cluidian range, so Penniclothii is on the hill the other side of the Wyler Valley, and the hill fort is very much positioned at the, um, at the joining of the two rivers, the Cluid and the Huayla. Here we've got um, a Google image of the hill fort, and we've got the first edition ordnance, uh, 19th century ordnance survey map of the hill fort. Um, the Google image is not particularly informative, um, and neither is the, the first edition Ordnance Survey map, really. Um, but I'll show you some more detailed images as we go through this. The thing to notice about the um, 19th century map is that the whole of the interior of the hill fort is covered in trees. And that is relevant for some of the things that I shall be saying uh, later on. So, uh, the first thing that we did was to look at LIDAR data, um, because obviously from LIDAR data you can get a very, very um, accurate image of the topography. And the nice thing about LIDAR data is that you can actually process the data in different ways. This is a fairly common way of processing it. It's called analytical hill shading, so that you can simulate the direction of sunlight and you can change that direction so you get different sorts of shadows and you can change the height of the sun. 
while we've got this image here, let me just point out the main characteristics of the topography of, of Bodfari. So in the northwestern quadrant, we've got two massive ramparts and ditches with a counterscarp bank on the outside. In the southwestern quadrant, it's different. There's just a single bank and ditch, and then the counterscarp bank is much further down the slope. What's going on on the eastern side and the southern side is not anywhere near as clear because the natural slope on the eastern side is much steeper. And there are several great big bites into the hillside, which is a combination of probably ice plucking because this area was very, very heavily glaciated and fairly recent quarrying. And there is the sort of ruins of a quarry building by one of these bites out of the eastern side. So we really don't know very much at all about the topography of the eastern side. At the north where my cursor is, there is an interned entrance. And you can see the way the rampart turns inwards there and turns inwards there. So they're sort of the main characteristics and we'll see these in a bit more detail as we go through. One of the nice things that you can do with LiDAR is manipulate it by using this process called multiscalar curvature. And what this does is highlight the tops of slopes and the bottoms of slopes. So here we've got the, um, the complete hill fort and the red is the tops of slopes. So in the northwest quadrant, you can see the two ramparts there and the counterscarp bank outside it. And the blue are the bottoms of slopes. So you can see the two ditches. You can see these little quarry, quarry hollows on the inside. Some of those may well be Iron Age. Notice, and I'll come back to this later in the talk, notice that in the southwestern quadrant, there is this red line at the top of this break of slope. And this is actually a phase one rampart that has been completely dismantled in this southwestern quadrant. Notice also on the eastern side that I've just been talking about, there is the hint of a rampart at the very top of the slope that goes round there, although it's very, very difficult to see on the ground. This is the interned entrance that I was talking about there. You can see the Western and the Eastern intern. And this is a sort of um, larger version of this Northwestern and Northern corner. And here you can see the interned entrance, the inner rampart swings inwards. And this one then swings round onto the Eastern side. And you can see very nicely the um, two ramparts and ditches um, little quarries and the counterscarp bank on the outside. Um, so based on field observation using traditional methods and on using the LIDAR, because this site, like many other sites in the Gridians and elsewhere in Wales, suffers very, very badly from bracken, so it's quite difficult to do an earthwork survey when your site's covered in bracken, even when we went back there in the winter. And so that LIDAR data was very useful in helping us produce this earthwork survey. So this is a later edition ordnance survey map from 1964, which is better than the first one, um, but it's not as good as ours. This is our final one. And you can see the Northwestern quadrant um, the two ramparts and counterscarp bank, interned entrance, the eastern side, and in the southwestern quadrant, this inner rampart has completely gone. So the only existing rampart is this one that's slightly further out, and the counterscarp bank is further down the slope. Notice also, because this image has got contours on it, that the contours are much closer together here 
than they are in the northwestern quadrant. So the approach in the northwest and the north is a much more gentle approach than this approach in the southwestern quadrant and indeed anywhere on the east. And that's relevant um, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So we'd ended geophysics, the resistance didn't really work very well, probably because of the geology. The magnetometry was slightly more informative. Notice on the magnetometry that again, at the top of this break of slope, there is the remains of this completely removed inner rampart where my cursor is going up and down there. And in the northwest quadrant, the two ramparts that you can see, there are various sorts of lines of, of anomalies. And I think these are probably post-medieval agricultural activity. Notice that there are lots of black blobs all over it. And we did excavate some of these and they turned out to be tree throws. So this is where the first edition Ordnance Survey map is relevant where it's covered in trees, whereas the, the site now is completely free of trees in the interior, although there are trees on the slopes, particularly in the southwestern quadrant. Now, there were holes dug into this site in um, 1908 by a local man called Philip Stapleton. He, he dug about, probably about nine or 10 holes, and he wrote a report. Um, from the report, it's almost, well, it is actually impossible to identify where his trenches were because his plan was not very good. But he does talk about digging a ditch, and this is his drawing of the ditch. And I suspect it's probably one of these main ditches in the northwestern quadrant. He also talks about finding an entrance on this western side where the ramparts are very, very disturbed um, and they're even more disturbed now because of Stapleton's hole. Uh, but we did excavate this area, so I'll say more about that area in a little bit. Um, this is the conclusion that Stapleton came to. If anything can be learned from an exploration which yielded nothing in the shape of a find, it is perhaps that Moli Gaia was at least never occupied by the Romans. Further than this, the evidence will not carry us. Well, we've got quite a bit more evidence now, so it will carry us a little bit further, but I do agree with him that this site was never occupied by the Romans. And in terms of actual finds, um, material culture finds, from seven seasons of excavation, our total number of finds were two stone spindle whirls. So we didn't really find much more than Stapleton in terms of finds. So the trenches we excavated, um, I won't say anything about number two or number four. Number six is on the interned entrance to the north. Number one is a roundhouse. Um, number three goes across the inner and the outer ramparts. Um, and number five, which is really the key one for understanding the sequence of this site, is this area where Stapleton dug a hole. And it's this area where the um, ramparts are very much um, damaged. We've got radiocarbon dates from trenches three, five, and six. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. So let's first of all have a look at trench one. So this is, this is um, a roundhouse and you can see on the geophysics this circular anomaly. And in fact, this is the only, pretty much, yeah, I would say it is on, the only um, what, we, what we would call an, an archeological anomaly um, in terms of it being contemporary with the hill fort from the whole of the uh, magnetometry survey over the whole interior. So this is an artificial terrace. So the bedrock was chopped away at the back to create an artificial terrace. And it's just inside the interned entrance. This is the interned entrance. So as you came through the entrance, you would see this artificial terrace 
with a roundhouse built on it and a stone bank around the lip of the terrace. So this is the plan of the excavation that we did. This is the geophysical anomaly. Um, this is the bedrock that was chopped away and the roundhouse was built up against it. Um, there's an area of flooring there. There's an area of a laid surface around it. And this is the stone bank around the lip of the um, terrace. And that's the entrance into the area where the roundhouse is. This is, this is it under excavation. So you can see the bedrock that's chopped away at the back, at the back of this trench here. The roundhouse is about there. And these are large boulders, large erratics um, placed on the top of this stone bank around the lip of this terrace. This is the laid surface outside the roundhouse. This is bedrock where it's cut away. This is the laid surface outside the roundhouse. Um, this is the bedrock chopped away. Now, we didn't get very much structural evidence for the roundhouse at all. But what we did get is these large lumps, which sort of correlated with the geophysical anomaly. So they were in a circle. And these were large lumps of clay rich material. This is one here. Um, so I think the walls of this roundhouse were some kind of cob material. Um, this is the area of flooring. It was very compact. Um, so the entrance through the wall, uh, the um, bank at the lip of the terrace sort of lines up with this area of flooring. Uh, the flooring didn't extend over the complete area of the circular anomaly. So it may have just been a sort of patch of flooring at the entrance into the roundhouse. This is one of the spindle whorls we found. So it's associated with the roundhouse, which is important because it shows that these sorts of domestic activities like um, um, spinning and perhaps weaving, although there was no evidence for weaving, but certainly spinning was taking place at some point uh, within the roundhouse, within this hill fort. Um, so this is the bank, that's the roundhouse there, the bank goes around the lip, this is the structure of the bank, and the rock is shale, and it's very, very easily broken. And so what I'm thinking is that many of the small stones here that you see on the top of this bank, which is, much of it is earth and sort of rubble, these stones were originally much bigger. And in the two and a half thousand years since they've been lying there, they've actually fractured. These are the big stones that just occurred at the entrance. This one's toppled over. So the entrance into the area where the roundhouse is, is through there. And this is one of the big revetting stones that you can see there on the inside of this stone bank. And it's from this deposit at the bottom of the bank that we got um, ra a radiocarbon date from some cattle bone, which I'll talk about later. So trench three, which is the one through the ramparts, this is looking from the break of slope at the top, uh, at the top of the slope, the break of slope. So this is looking from the upper, phase one rampart and it's looking down onto this lower phase two rampart and I'll say more about the phases when we get to trench five because that's the key trench for understanding the phases. So you can see that this rampart is still um, extant, it's, it's about sort of two meters high as an earthwork. So this is the section through, the, through that lower rampart. Um, this is an ortho photo, which you may or may not be able to make out detail. Um, but what we've got here on this traditional drawn section is a rock cut ditch, which is filled with rampart material as the rampart collapsed into the ditch. We've got an outer face, 
rocks there. So there's a rock cut ditch and a berm, then an outer face. And then we've got um, two inner faces because there are two phases of this inner face. So it was made bigger in the second phase. And then we've got a phase three at the back, which is a pile of stones revetting the phase two rear face. We'll see this in a bit more detail. So this is the rock cut ditch. And what we identified in the rock cut ditch in the fill, uh, because the fill varied in characteristics. Um, there, were, there were large stones. There were two, um, two levels of large stones and then lots of smaller ones between. So I think the first level of large stones is actually the collapse of the outer face because between the outer and the inner face, it was filled with rubble, shale rubble, which was very, very um, insecure, I suppose. It moved around a lot. And I think this rampart would have probably collapsed fairly easily. So we've got the outer face collapse, then rubble, and then more larger stones, which could have been some of the in the face falling down. So here we've got the berm, that's the ditch. And here in section, you can see the outer face. So you can see that it's made up of flat bits of shale, some of them quite sizable, laid on top of each other, dry stone walling. And then in the interior of the rampart, it's just filled with soil and rubble. These are the two inner faces. Now, the two inner faces were not exactly on the same line. And you can see that the first phase is here and the second phase is there. So in this photograph, you can see this is the phase one inner face. This is the phase two inner face that you can see in section there. You can see it going up, so it's higher than the first phase. And then we've got the, whether this is part of phase two or a separate phase, um, we never really got to the bottom of. I think it's probably a, sec a separate phase as the phase two face began to deteriorate. And this is a pile of um, stones piled up against the inner face. And there was some structure in it. You can see that some of these large stones actually form sort of baffles within this pile of stone. If we now move on to the Stapleton's Western entrance, um, it, it, you may have noticed from the earthwork plan that it's very, very confused around here. There's actually a gap, which is a sheep run now, but there's a gap through all of the ramparts into the interior. Um, this is the northwest quadrant inner rampart, which is still very big, very extant. This is the beginning of the southwestern quadrant, where the rampart has pretty much disappeared. Um, here's a, an aerial photograph, um, and this gives a very good image of what I'm talking about. So the northwestern quadrant. Here you can see the two massive ramparts and ditches and the counterscarp bank. The southwestern quadrant, this rampart continues lower down the slope and on the top of the break of slope, which is there and goes into our trench, the rampart has pretty much disappeared and the counterscarp bank continues much lower down. Notice also the topography of the interior of this hill fort. It's by no means flat. It's got this very, very steep um, hill at the northern end, which gives you very good views over the interned entrance and the whole of this sort of northwestern, northwestern quadrant. Um, so this is a plan and it, it's a little bit detailed and a little bit complicated so let me just sort of try and talk you through it. 
Here we've got the line. This is the extant rampart, the inner rampart of the northwestern quadrant. And this originally continued down here. And this is the line of the phase one rampart, which is now pretty much destroyed. Some of the phase one features that we excavated were a little quarry hollow there. Um, this little circular structure, which could be some kind of guard chamber, although it's pretty small for a guard chamber. And then this very nice sort of end revetment to the rampart. But a not much else was left of the phase one rampart. This was a very sterile area with no archaeology whatsoever and pretty much straight down onto bedrock um, from the uh, beneath what turf there was and there wasn't very much turf there. Um, so what happened at the end of phase one is that this rampart was pretty much destroyed the rubble was spread out down slope because it's a very steep slope down to the west. And the phase two rampart cut through the end of the phase one, one rampart there and continued in a different line. And this goes to the trench three that we've just seen. So this is phase two rampart that joins phase one rampart in this very strange angle and actually cuts through the end of the phase one rampart. So in the first phase, this was an entrance. This was a Western entrance um, with a slight intern that incorporated this, this little circular structure. But in the second phase, that entrance was blocked off. The entrance itself wasn't blocked, but this rampart was dismantled and access to that entrance was completely blocked by the building of the phase two rampart in that direction outside the phase one entrance. So this is the section through the phase one and phase two rampart uh, at the end of the northwest quadrant. The phase one rampart is this much darker material, uh, sorry, this much redder material and it had a very nice outer face. This is the outer face of the phase one rampart. So it's there. And then it sloped down with lots of layers of stuff in this very red clay material. Um, and we're not quite sure what happened at the end, uh, the, the inner face of it. The bedrock was scarped away to provide material for the rampart. The phase two rampart, was simply um, making the phase one rampart higher. So several more layers were added onto the top of this phase one red material. But also importantly, this revetting wall at the back that you can see here, a revetting wall was built to contain this material on the inside. And the revetting wall actually then sloped up the top of the rampart, creating a surface on the top of the rampart. So presumably people could climb onto the rampart and then walk up the slope on the top and be on the top of the rampart there. Um, now this is the tricky bit. This is where the phase two rampart, and this is the inner face of the phase two rampart, cuts through this big phase one rampart. So this is the outer face of the phase one rampart, and this is the um, inner face of the phase two rampart going there. So the outer face of the phase two rampart is further down here, and the filling of the phase two rampart completely covered the outer face of the phase one rampart in this, in this place. I'm sorry if this is confusing, all this phase one and phase two stuff, but it was actually quite a tricky bit of excavation to try and understand. So the surviving features of the phase one entrance are this sort of um, end of the rampart, if you like, part of the entrance passage that you can see there that was not quite nicely built. And this is the little 
um, well, these days they're called entrance recesses rather than guard chambers, because guard chamber is obviously a bit of a loaded term, which gives the impression of somebody standing there on guard. So this is the entrance recess, which um, is part of this phase one, phase one entrance. If, um, if we now take a quick look at the interned entrance, so this is trench six, this is the entrance as it looks today. So this is the northern rampart. This is the big inner rampart of the, the northwestern quadrant that swings around to the north and then swings inwards with this intern. This is the eastern intern, which connects to the rampart going around the eastern side. So you can see that there's not actually very much left of this eastern intern on the ground. It's just a low bank. Well, we excavated the Eastern Intern and it turned out to be this sort of hopped feature, um, which the end of it swings inwards. So this is the entrance passage here. And this is one of the gate post holes at the end of this um, intern, this hopped intern. And in the plan here, you can see the intern the um, post hole and notice that on the plan we excavated a two meter slot at the northern end which was went much deeper because there was a huge amount of material to remove here and we just didn't have the resources or the time to be able to remove it all. So what we decided to do was to remove it in a two meter slot and see if there was anything below. And it's good that we did because below there is actually a phase one rampart. And these big stones that you can see here on the plan are the inner face of the phase one, um, phase one. And this is an entrance, I think, the phase one entrance and the outer face of the phase one entrance is that line there giving a um, rampart width of about two and a half to three meters. So this is the phase one um, inner face of the rampart made of these massive, these massive stones as you can see. Um, so this is the entrance passage uh, to this side of it and the phase two hopped in turn as you can see here um, swings inwards. This is the gate post um, and the slot is at the other end of the trench. And this is a different view of it. So here you can see the phase one and what happened was that again the phase one, the phase one rampart at this point was dismantled. Um, stones were spread around. A huge amount of material, all of this shale rubble, was then built, was um, deposited over the top of the phase one rampart to create this nice level surface and this level um, passageway. And then the, the hooked intern was the um, dry stone walling that you can see around there. And like the rampart in trench three, it was filled with rubble. Notice that the slope is very steep on that side. So there wasn't actually uh, much of a revetting wall on that side because of the slope. Um, and inside of this hooked intern, there was a laid surface. So in a way, this, this hooked intern is almost creating, I wouldn't call it a guard chamber, but it's certainly creating a space in here, which is right next to the entrance passageway with a nice laid surface. So um, just to sort of summarize all this then, um, what we've got is definitely two phases. The first phase enclosure is univallate. And that's represented by the thick black line that you can see around there. 
Um, it's got a western entrance and it's got a northern entrance, although the full character of the northern entrance we don't know, um, although we do know a bit more about the western entrance. It's the one with the guard, the um, entrance recess. And according to the radiocarbon dates, this first phase is pre 4th, 5th century BC. I'll say more about the dates in a minute. Um, in the second phase, it becomes bivalate in the northwestern quadrant. So we've got the two ramparts and ditches and the counterscarp bank is added. But in the southwestern quadrant, the inner rampart of phase one is removed and there's just a single rampart and ditch further down the slope with um, the counterscarp bank. The northern entrance is enhanced and it's made interned and we've got the roundhouse and the terrace and the radiocarbon date suggests that they are contemporary with the building of this second phase northern entrance. And this is fourth to second century uh, calibrated BC. So it's slightly odd. Well, well, it's not that odd if you look at a lot of hill forts, this quite often happens, that you've got these different configurations of ramparts around different points of the circuit. And one of the reasons for this may well be what I mentioned earlier, the fact that in the northwestern quadrant, you've got a much gentler approach, a much more gentle approach to the hill fort than you've got in the southwestern quadrant. Now, you could interpret this as the ramparts being defensive. If you've got a much more gentle slope, perhaps that's where if, if this was going to be attacked, then you would need more defences, so you have more ramparts. Or you could interpret it in a slightly different way. And this is sort of reflecting on the work of Toby Driver in Keridigian, um, where he suggested that certain areas of rampart building and entrances are enhanced to be impressive and to look good as people approach hill forts um, in, in the easiest direction. There's no doubt that during the Iron Age, during the use of this hill fort, people would have approached it um, from this northwestern quadrant, either in the western gate or they would have gone round to the northern gate. Um, these are the radiocarbon dates. Um, and you can see that they spread from quite early, although they're not to do with the rampart, um, up to the, the sort of probably second century BC. Um, but I, I will interpret these in a more simple fashion for you um, to make sense of them. And this is done by Sewark at Glasgow, the, the radio carbon laboratory and Derek Hamilton there has done some Bayesian modelling and this is the result of his Bayesian modelling. So interestingly in a cut feature underneath the phase one rampart we've got some very early dates 1280 to 1215. Now there's no way that I'm suggesting their dates for the phase one rampart, they're far far too early. Um, but there was obviously activity there on the top of the hill in, in the Bronze Age. The phase one rampart, and this is from Trench 5, and it's a level um, associated with the remodelling of the entrance recess, gives us a terminus antiquem of 500 to 395. That's for the phase one rampart. Then we've got three different places where we've got dates for the phase two, what I'm calling phase two. We've got a pre-rampart surface in trench three, which gives this um, terminus postquem. So the date is that or after it. And then we've got the bank around the roundhouse and we've got from cereal grain and charcoal 
associated with the um, construction of the interned entrance of 350 to 175. So there's a couple of important points from these dates. The first is that the phase one rampart could well have not been the building of it, not all that much earlier than the phase two modifications. And then the second interesting point is that the phase two modifications are pretty much um, contemporary, but perhaps not exactly contemporary. So rather than using the term phase, um, I've never much liked the term phase, although we do all use it, which implies that things just happened at one time. What we seem to have here is a whole sequence of gradual changes that took place perhaps over 200 years of these ramparts. So people were, were working over a long period of time on changing the ramparts and changing the configuration of this site. So what sort of conclusions can we draw from this? Well, as I've just explained, we've got two main phases, if you want to stick with that term phase of rampart entrance building, possibly only a short period of time between the two, phase two over a long period of time, relatively. Um, the evidence certainly doesn't suggest permanent occupation. I mean, the one roundhouse showed upon the geophysics, but nothing else. Um, and of course, there could be roundhouses that don't leave um, marks and don't leave a trace on the geophysics. But certainly the evidence that we've got suggests that this place was not permanently occupied and was perhaps just visited at certain times of the year to take place in certain, certain activities there. But to be able to argue that, you really need to know more about contemporary settlements. If people weren't living in the hill fort, then where were they living? And one of the things about the Cluidian area is that we really know very little about contemporary settlements. Um, you know, if we were arguing this for Wessex, say, then we've got lots of contemporary farmsteads and it's much easier to argue that people were living in farmsteads and the hill fort was some kind of central place that would bring together a dispersed community at certain times of the year. But it's much more difficult to argue that when, you actually, when you've actually got very little evidence for other settlements. And then of course, there's always the possibility of transhumans. If people were living elsewhere, were they just taking their animals up onto these hilltops um, during the summer for summer pastures? The evidence that we've got um, from Bodfari um, suggests small scale agricultural activities, certainly small scale from what we can see in the hill fort. Um, sheep, because we've got the spindle whirl. Um, bone just didn't survive very well at all, but we did get that cattle bone uh, with the radiocarbon date. Uh, we got wheat grains and, and weed grains. So there is agricultural activity going on around there, um, but quite putting your finger on to what extent that was and where it was taking place is difficult because all of these could have just been um, taken into the hill fort at different times of the year. Right, well, I'd like to just finish by showing you a couple of slides, because one of the interesting things about this project is that we did have two artists in residence working with us. And it was a fantastically interesting experience because their artwork was based entirely on the excavations and, and it was just fascinating how they saw things in a completely different way to how we did. So this is Simon Callery, who's a painter, and this is his painting based on the excavations of Bodfari. This is him doing it. He has these very, very thick canvases that he lays over trenches, and then he cuts around features, and he, he, it's sort of three-dimensional, so you can see through. So what you see in here is a sort of um, representation of one of the trenches at Bodfari. 
the other other artists um, is, is much more of a sort of electronic artist. His name is Stefan Gant. And what Stefan did was record thousands and thousands and thousands of trowel scrapes. This is people making a noise when they're troweling. And he put it all together in various ways. And this is the piece of artwork that he produced, um, which, which um, did actually win a prize, but I can't remember exactly what prize it was. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, that's it. So um, thank you very much for listening. And I need to thank this, this list of people, not just the diggers and the landowners, Fiona Gale and Will Davis of Caddo, um, but also the funders for this. And um, this excavation will be published this summer. Um, we've nearly finished it and it's going to be published as an Archeo Press book. Thank you very much. Mm.